I'm Chris Seaton. This is a talk about Ruby's C extension problem and how we're solving it. I work for Oracle. I work on a new implementation of Ruby called JRuby Truffle. I'll talk a bit about what JRuby Truffle is and our progress on it, but the main thing I'll talk about is the C extension problem and why it is we need to solve it. Oracle wants you to know this is just a research project, so you shouldn't buy anything from Oracle based on this being a real project that you can, you can use. It's just research. So lots of people want to make Ruby faster. Um, lots of people run applications and they see them not running as fast as they'd like. Maybe they're moving to other languages because they aren't as fast as they'd like. Um, MRI, the main Ruby project, they've been trying a tracing JIT in the past. They're trying a deoptimization engine. They're planning to make Ruby three times faster by Ruby 3.0 if they can. JRuby have always been trying to make Ruby faster. They run on the JVM and they use the optimizations that gives you to make it faster. And Rubinius uses LLVM to make Ruby faster. It's a JIT written in C++. Um, AppVea have hired someone, a Ruby fellow, to make Ruby faster. In the past, some of you may be newer to the Ruby community, so don't remember, there was a project called Maglev, which was another alternative implementation of Ruby to make it faster. And even IBM are now working on it with OMR, which is another plan to make MRI faster. And these are all applying optimizations, new ideas about how to represent Ruby programs and how to make them faster. But the, the traditional way to make Ruby faster that works today and people have been using for years is to use C extensions. The idea is that you have a Ruby program that's running on the Ruby interpreter and you can write an extension to the Ruby interpreter in C. And you compile that with a C compiler like you normally would and you get a, a binary library which you can plug into Ruby. And this extends the Ruby interpreter effectively and gives you new methods that are, they appear as if they were written in the core library. And you can use those from your Ruby program, and they're about as fast as methods written in the core library, um, which historically has been pretty good performance. And it's been an effective way to increase the performance of Ruby. I'll give you an example of what that looks like. We have here a clamp routine. So it clamps a number between a minimum and a maximum. This is taken from some real code, a library called uh, psd.rb, processing Photoshop files. Um, and this is slow, and it's slow because it does lots of things. It creates an array of minimum, the number, and the maximum. It sorts it, which creates another array, and then it indexes it to, to take the middle one. And this is an effective way of getting a number clamped between two values, uh, but it's slow. So what psd.rb provides is a C extension called PSD native, and in this one they write it in C code instead. So this is a C function. It takes parameters and it, takes, it makes the, the self-parameter explicit in C. Um, they convert the parameters from Ruby numbers to C numbers and then they use some simple C logic to work out the, the value clamped between the two. And that's faster because it doesn't do things like allocations. It doesn't run a sort routine. Um, and therefore that is an effective way to make that faster. But C extensions hold us back. They've been an effective way to increase the performance of Ruby so far, um, but there are some really key problems with them. This is the model people have of C extensions in their head. Um, they think there's the Ruby interpreter, they think there's the C extension API, and then they write their C extension. And they assume that the communication between the two is nice and ordered and goes through a proper interface to find in Ruby.h. And they assume that other implementations can use that. So they assume that if you've got an API, you can just swap out underneath what you're using. So they think JRuby should be able to implement that and Rubinius should be able to implement it. And Rubinius is written in C++, which is similar to C anyway. So it really seems like it should be able to just plug in effectively. But the bad news is that isn't a thing in practice. There is no Ruby API. All there is is the entire internals of Ruby dumped out into a header file. And you can use any parts of the internals of Ruby and you can poke around and you can do anything. Um, in reality, it's much more like this. The C extension has thousands upon thousands of ways to reach right into the internals of MRI. And it's really clear how MRI works when you use the C extension API. And that's, that's obviously a bad thing. When other implementations of Ruby try to implement that C extension API, they've got all these things coming in them from, them from all angles, wanting to do all sorts of stuff. And they've got no idea about how we're going to hook that up and how we're going to do anything with all these calls that are demanding so much of us. And this isn't just a problem for alternative implementations of Ruby. This isn't the case of the alternative implementations moaning and saying that everyone should change to suit them. Because of MRI is also not able to develop and not able to become faster because of these restrictions. So as they try to make MRI faster for Ruby 3, 
they're going to find that as they've got good ideas of things they want to change, the C extension API will hold them back because there are people trying to reach in and use things that they want to remove or change. I'll give you some concrete examples of things which reach in and, and cause problems. Uh, this is from OpenSSL, so the OpenSSL C extension. Um, this is from MRI's code base. It's a, a C extension which is shipped with MRI, so this should really be best practice. Um, but it isn't. We have this function here, R string pointer, which takes a Ruby string and gives you the C pointer to the character data within it. And this is used by OpenSL, for example, to take the, the pointer to your password and then to call a, a native code function for, for the OpenSSL API and to do something with it. And this makes sense in MRI because in MRI, every string has a character pointer implemented in C that has that string data in it. But in other implementations of Ruby, we may not want to have a real character pointer. Obviously, in JRuby, they have a Java byte array, which isn't the same thing as a character pointer at all. And as we get more and more optimizations, it becomes even more problematic. I'll show an example later of we're trying to use an implementation of strings which isn't even a linear sequence in data. So trying to get that character pointer reaches right in and makes loads of assumptions about how the, the data structure is implemented. It's also done for arrays. So you can get the internal pointer to the, the values in an array. And the PSD extension uses this, for example. It gets the native array, which represents the pixels in an image, and then processes them. And this means that you're restricted to representing your Ruby arrays as a linear sequence of very heavyweight Ruby values for numbers. And we'd like to represent in arrays of just normal numbers as simple, compact arrays of numbers, but we can't uh, if we implement this C extension API directly. The C extension API, when I say it exposes all the internals of Ruby, I even mean it exposes the internal fields of the structures which represent Ruby objects. So this is our data, which a data is a class in the core library, and it inherits from the Ruby basic object, and it has fields for any data you want to store in there, and it has even C function callbacks for marking that data and freeing it, which the garbage collector uses. And then you have macros to manage these. These macros were an effort to make the C extension API better. So they thought if we, if we wrap up accessing these fields um, as macros, then we can implement the macros in different ways. But in this case, the, the macro is actually used on the left-hand side of an expression. So it needs to evaluate to something which is assignable. So that isn't, haven't, hasn't helped us much. And it's not just about being able to implement the, the API. The C extension API makes C extensions slow. Um, when you call foo.2s in Ruby, uh, conceptually you look up the, the method to call from that name each time. Um, you go through all the modules involved and see which method to call. But in reality what we do is we cache what we found last time and use that value the next time. And that happens transparently for you. But we can only do that in Ruby because we're controlling our execution happens. And in C, when you call RB fun call to call a function, um, there's no way to store a cache to do that. So this means that a method call done in a C extension is actually slower than a method call done in Ruby. Um, ages ago in the past, Ruby didn't really have things like inline caches and stuff like that. It worked in quite a different way. So this wasn't a problem in the past, but now it is a problem. And the Ruby is slower than the C. In terms of optimizing and providing lots of, uh, lots of uh, clever computer science optimizations on code, the C extensions are a black box. If I look as a compiler at a code like um, add, where it adds together two numbers, and we just simply call that, I can look at that, and my optimizer can see that that reduces the value 16, provided some assumptions about things not being monkey patched and stuff like that, which we can, we can get around using other techniques I've talked about in the past. But the, the C code, is compiled to native code ahead of time. The source code's long gone, and we can't inspect the, the compiled machine code in any meaningful way. So I can't compile add 14.2 to any value if it's in the native code. So again, this makes the native code slower than the Ruby code if we have a powerful optimizing compiler, which MRI wants to add, so they're gonna see this, this boundary as well. Previous solutions to the C extension problem. So people do know this is a problem, and they do want to solve it. Denial. 
This has been the first proposed solution to the C extension problem. So FFI and Fiddle are two libraries which allow you to call C functions directly from Ruby. So instead of writing C code, which calls them, you simply call them directly from Ruby. And these, are, these are effective ways to write C extensions. But the problem is there's, there's 2.1 billion lines of code inside the Ruby gem repositories, and half a billion of it is C extensions. It would be nice, perhaps, if people used FFI to write C extensions, but they don't. So there's little point arguing about it. If we want to run people's code today, we need to run C extensions. There's no point going up to them and telling them they're wrong and they should be writing it in FFI. Even the C extensions inside MRI don't use the FFI. So uh, there's no point arguing about it. This is what the FFI looks like. You can simply say, I'm using this library and I want this function and these are its types and it magically appears. So it is a great way to write C extensions, but if people aren't doing it, they aren't doing it. Bargaining. We can attempt to implement the, the C extension API as best as possible alongside our optimizations. Uh, this generally involves a lot of copying. So if we have our string represented in a really clever way internally, when we want to expose that to the C extension, we could copy it all out to a big um, C array. But the problem with that is it's an un unbounded problem size. And your string could be gigabytes in size. And if each time you go to C and back again, you copy the whole thing, everything's just gonna grind to a halt. JRuby used this approach in the past, and Rubinius still uses it today. JRuby, when I tried, only ran about 60% of the C extensions that I was interested in. Uh, Rubinius ran 90%, which was better. But the worst thing was, when they didn't work, there was no error telling me this is incompatible. They just ground to a halt, uh, you know, continuing to make progress, but at a really, really slow pace, because as the copying, the things they decided they wanted to copy grew and grew, um, they, they didn't really work. And there was no clear failure point, they just didn't work. So that was a, a limitation. We can try to improve the C extension API from MRI over time. A JavaScript, as in V8, and uh, Java C extensions API don't really have these problems because they've designed it with the, the knowledge of this problem ahead of time. So they have better designed APIs which don't expose internals. And there is steady progress towards doing this in MRI, and it has helped. But as I say, even OpenSL doesn't use those better interfaces. So if MRI aren't gonna do it themselves, we can't really tell anyone else to do it. So from the, the C extension documentation, it tells you don't touch pointers directly. Don't use RRA pointer, don't use R string pointer. And if people didn't, there wouldn't be so much of a problem. Depression. JRuby unfortunately had to give up on their C extension work. They had someone really clever work on it for quite a long time. Um, he managed to get it working. But as I said, it would have this problem that would generally ground to a fault. Um, and in the end, they decided they unfortunately didn't have the resources to maintain it. Uh, the original developer moved on and they decided to remove it entirely. Maybe it will return in the future and they could try using the same approach as we are in JRuby Truffle. And acceptance. JRuby encouraged people to write Java extensions instead of C extensions, which is a technique which works fine. But as I said, if people aren't writing uh, FFI, then we can't make them write Java extensions either. We can also try to optimize Ruby while we're keeping the internals the same. So IBM's OMR adds a new GC and JIT to Ruby, to root MRI, while keeping support for C extensions. But the techniques they can use, therefore, are very limited. And the performance increases we can expect from that, therefore, are much more modest. Interlude, JRuby Truffle. So I'll give an introduction to our project and how it works. So there's already an implementation of Ruby which works on the JVM called JRuby. Um, but the JVM, is a bit of a black box, which makes their work very difficult. When they want to optimize code, what they can do is they can pour bytecode into the top of the JVM. They can generate the best bytecode they can, but then they pour it into the top, and at some point within the JVM, there's a JIT compiler, and it's an excellent JIT compiler, but the route to it can sometimes be quite torturous, especially for the, the bytecode they emit from JRuby, which isn't the same as Java bytecode always. And often it fails to reach the JIT, or when it, fail, when it reaches the JIT, it doesn't quite do what they'd like with it. Our big idea at Oracle is to take the JIT outside the JVM, rewrite it in Java, and expose it as a Java library. And that means you can talk back and forth to it, and you can tell it much more precisely what you want to do. That's quite tricky to do, so we wrote a framework on top of that called Truffle, which helps you to write languages and talks to Graal on your behalf. We took code from MRI, we took code from JRuby, and we took some code from Rubinius, and we wrote a new implementation of Ruby based on JRuby using Truffle as an API that works on top of the, the Graal VM, which is simply the JVM combined with 
uh, the Graal compiler. We're part of the JRU repository and part of the JRU project, um, and we are part of their releases today. The way Truffle works is if we take some expression like A plus B times C, we can express that as a tree. We heard the, the end of day keynote yesterday when he was talking about how he expressed um, code as an AST, which is a data structure like this. And what we do in Truffle is we can take that code, that AST, and we can compile it down to a single module that includes all the logic involved in executing that tree. Um, then we have a JIT compiler which takes it and turns it into a graph, which looks like this. This is an actual screenshot from compiling that code using our tool. Um, and then we can produce optimized machine code from this. Um, this machine code is some x86-64 machine code that multiplies two numbers together and then adds another number to it. And you notice we do optimizations here, such as Ruby has overflow that converts to a big num. Uh, we do that by handling that by jumping on overflow. So if the, if the multiplication overflows, we jump off and do something else. If the add overflows, we jump off and do something else. But in, if it doesn't, we simply keep this linear sequence of instructions. So this code is almost as good as you'd get from an AC compiler. The only extra thing you get from this is the, the JOs. And your processor is very clever and will actually do something called fusion of the JO with the add. So it's almost as if they're not there in terms of cycle counts. So from Ruby code, even though it has things like monkey patching and overflow, we can actually produce machine code that's almost as good as C. So going back to C extension, this is our radical solution for C extensions. The current model, as I said, is we've got Ruby that runs on a Ruby interpreter, but C extensions are compiled separately and then plugged into the Ruby interpreter. Our idea is simple. We're gonna take the C code and we're gonna interpret it using a C interpreter. We already have a Ruby interpreter, Let's write a C interpreter and then run it on top. And then when we want to make changes to the way Ruby works, we simply make changes to the way our C interpreter works to match it. It's slightly more complicated in reality. We don't want to have to deal with all the complexity of the preprocessor and type checking and stuff like that. So what we actually do is we take your C extension, we compile it using the LLVM C compiler, that's C clang, um, and that produces some, a intermediate representation that's like a really simple version of C that we call IR and then we interpret that. The other benefit of this is if you have other languages like Go, Rust, C++, Objective-C, as long as they can all compile to LLVM's intermediate representation, we can run that on top of the interpreter. So if we take a, a real C extension, such as this clamp example we had earlier, this compiles to IR, which looks like this. Now it looks like that's really complex, but let me break it down for you. I'll zoom in on just the bit which does the logic. So. It still looks complicated, but if I, if I write this as pseudocode in Ruby, you can see that this IECMP actually just does a compare. The branch just does like an if, and then it does go to. Ruby doesn't have go to's, obviously, but assume they're there. Um, and then we have a compare less than, which is here. So really, we have a language which is very simple. We've already written an interpreter that works really well for the whole of Ruby. If you imagine we're writing something that is for much simpler for this little pretend language here, that's actually quite easy to do. You probably think of C as being a really complicated, deep, highly technical language. It's used for highly technical stuff because it relies on the machine architecture most of the time. But in terms of a language, it's really simple. It's much easier to write an interpreter for C or LLVMIR than it is for Ruby. And then the magic starts to be that we're optimizing these two languages using the same technology. We produce these trees of the programs for both Ruby code and C code. And when it gets to Truffle and Graal, our optimizing system, they don't care which language it came from. Even more than that, they don't know which language it came from. They simply ignore that. So we represent the Ruby code and the C code in the same way, so we can actually optimize them together. If you have a Ruby function that calls a C function in your C extension that calls back into Ruby, we can inline those together and optimize them together and any barriers you have between them all disappear. Some interesting problems we found are their solutions. Um, because we're implementing the C extension API from scratch, we decided we could actually do most of it in Ruby. Um, I think Rubinius does this to a little extent, but we're doing it uh, for most of it. So if we have a, a C extension API function like fix2 int, which takes a fixed num and turns it into a real C integer, um, we wrote the entry point, into, we wrote our C code that simply says invoke using Truffle, and then we wrote a, an implementation of it in Ruby. 
So every time you call a simple little function in the C extension API, it goes back into Ruby. And this is where everything works out because if we can do whatever we like in Ruby. We can access, if we've written a clever way to access strings, we can simply reuse that clever way to access strings from our C extension code. So taking strings as a concrete example, as I said, if you take a pointer to a string, then you get a, a, a pointer to it and you can index it and you can read the exact character. And by the time you get this character pointer, it's been forgotten that it came from a string. It's just raw C data. Um, we represent strings using a technique called ropes. There was a talk by Kevin Menard at uh, Ruby Kai Gay. The idea is if you concatenate two strings, let's not copy anything. Let's just remember they were concatenated. Um, so we represent hello Ruby Conf if you concatenate them as two separate arrays of characters. The LLVM IR to read this simply says get element pointer, and then we can implement get element pointer however we like because we're interpreting it. So we can say if it's a string, go back and call the actual string indexing routine. And that string indexing routine can go and walk through this data structure and find the particular character. So we solve the problem of um, being able to access the raw data by giving you the illusion of having the raw data. The C extension believes it has a character pointer to a string. What it really has is an object that says, this is the Ruby object, and this is where you want to index it, and it goes off and it reads that. Um, but there's no way of detecting you've got that in C, in your C extension code. You think you've just got a raw number, but it's an illusion. You don't have a number. And the only way to do, realize the illusion actually would be to try and print the number out because there is no address, there is no number. Results. So, this is from an earlier piece of work we did. We actually started off trying to do this C interpreter um, before we tried the LLVM approach. Um, so these results are slightly old. We haven't got quite to this stage yet of our new implementation using an LLVM. So this is the performance of benchmarks from Chunky PNG and uh, Oily PNG, the native version, and PSD.RB and PSD native, the native version. And this is how fast the code is compared to the pure Ruby version. So there's a pure Ruby version of all this code and a C extension version. So MRI with the C extension gets you 10 times faster than running the Ruby code. And that's a successful result. C extensions were making things faster. When we run Rubinius with the C extension, it's only around four and a half times faster. And when we run JRuby with the C extension, it was even slower. Um, as I said, JRuby aren't using this approach anymore. So this is from JRuby 1.6. But this is still how Rubinius expects you to run C extension. And the performance is lower than MRI with the C extension, which isn't what Rubinius promises and what people use Rubinius for. When we run JRuby Truffle with the C extension, with our C interpreter, it's actually three times faster than running MRI with the C extension. So we're running the Ruby code and the C code in an interpreter with a JIT, of course, three times faster than the native code. And that sounds crazy. People think it can't possibly run faster than the native code. It's because, as I said, you, it's a black box. And MRI um, can't do anything to optimize access to that black box. And it's uncached when you make method calls that aren't caches. So when we apply these techniques to C, we get much better performance. We wanted to pin down exactly where the real benefit was. So we tried turning off inlining from C to Ruby and back and forth. And that's the result you see here, which is only just faster than MRI with the C extension. So we found a lot of it was to do with uh, inlining between the two languages. If we take a hot loop, you can take the C code and the Ruby code and all together and optimize it. And this is from a, a paper we presented last year at Modularity, a conference. There are some limitations, it's true. You do need the source code of your C extension. I'm not sure this is a problem for anyone in reality. I'm not sure if there are any closed source C extensions anyone using. If there are, come and tell me about them. Um, C extensions in turn using a closed source library that itself doesn't use the C API, that's fine. So if you have some proprietary database and a driver for it, as long as you have the source code for the C extension part, that's fine. You can't store pointers to Ruby objects in native code. So if you're using a compiled library like libssl, you can't give that compiled library a reference to a Ruby object. And this is sometimes tricky because of you may have a callback that goes into Ruby and you want to store some data um, from Ruby in the native object. Um, but the Ruby object may not really exist. We may want to be able to move it in the GC. Um, so what we've written is this little API for turning an object into a native handle and back again. So if you want to store some data in SSL, you need to convert it to a native handle. 
This is what Rubinius and JRuby were sort of doing anyway, but they were doing it for all data. We're doing it just targeted in a little couple of places. This is a problem at the moment because if we don't want people to have to modify their C extensions. It's okay for OpenSSL because that ships with Ruby, um, but we, we want to solve this problem for other C extensions and we're still working on that. By the way, I criticize the FFI because nobody is using it, but it is probably still the best idea to write your C extension using the FFI if you can, because it has wide support across um, all implementations of Ruby, although we don't actually implement ES in Jerry, we truffle. That'd be a great internship project if anyone's interested. If you do write a C extension for performance, I think it's a great idea to write a Ruby baseline version. This is what PSD and Chunky do, and that means that maybe the pure Ruby version will actually run fast enough anyway in Jerry, we truffle or Ruby 3.0. Java extensions. I said in the past that um, the way that Joey have solved the C extension problem is encouraging people to write Java extensions. Ironically, we have exactly the same problem as C extensions in that there is no well-defined Joey API. It's just all their internals exposed. They created the same problem that they have themselves from C. Um, so we, we have trouble hooking up all those things and we don't, therefore, at the moment, support Java extensions. But we can do exactly the same thing. We can take your Java extension written for JRuby, we can compile it to Java bytecode, and then we can write a Java bytecode interpreter and provide the same kind of abstractions and illusions to make it work on JRuby Truffle. And this idea in general could be a direction for MRI as well. Evan Phoenix at Ruby Kai Gay last year talked about the idea of storing the LLVM IR of the MRI implementation code and using it to jet at runtime. Um, that's a similar approach to what we're doing. That's it in my talk about C extensions, but a quick status update on Joby Truffle in general. Uh, we're running classic research benchmarks around 10 to 20 times faster than MRI and around 10 times faster than JRuby. Uh, J Truffle is in red here, JRuby with Invoke Dynamic in dark green and MRI in orange. Um, we're not much faster if you're memory allocation bound or if you're bound on the performance of something like big integer because those aren't the things we improve the performance of particularly. But if you're doing some highly computational code like an n-body simulation, it's around 40 times faster. But I understand you people aren't doing n-body simulations. It's okay. The MRI people who are focusing on making Ruby three times faster um, have got a benchmark they call OptCarrot. It's a NES emulator. Um, this is what they're going to try and make faster for Ruby 3.0. We run this around nine times faster than MRI. Um, Invoke Dynamic JRuby runs about twice as fast as MRI at the moment. Um, and all implementations are looking at OptCarrot at the moment, so these numbers will probably move around. Um, but we run it fast enough, the, the nine times faster is enough to make it smooth and playable, where it didn't very smooth and playable on MRI. In terms of completeness, we pass 99% of the language specs. It was 100%, and then people helpfully added some more. We passed 96% of the core library specs and 78% of the standard library specs, but that last one's a bit misleading because the coverage is a bit weird. Um, we're also now running Rails tests. We actually support 100% of active support and active model, most of action pack, some of royalties, and some other stuff like active record, active action view, uh, basic functionality does work there. So we are now able to run Rails. We have a, a basic blog application using Rails that we wrote ourselves that was simple enough, and we can run that, it works. So it's been several years, three years or so, we are now running Rails. Thanks. So why can't we run any real applications? If we've got that far, if we support such a high proportion of the language specs, why can't we run anything? Well, it's these C extensions. This is the most important thing at the moment. They're still a work in progress, and we've got almost no database drivers. OpenSSL doesn't work yet. Noku Euro doesn't work. And they are at the bottom of the dependency stack for almost every Rails application and any other Ruby application anywhere, especially the testing. People often use Noku Giri to test applications, to look at the DOM and figure things out. Um, and we, of course, we need to be able to test things to figure out they work. So this stops us running almost any application. And the specs also don't have perfect coverage. We do very sophisticated optimizations, which means that you can't just test that array accessing works. You need to act, practice it works with an integer array and a double array and things like that. Um, so the specs don't help us there. Um, I mean, you also need to tune performance. There's lots more stuff there. 
Um, you can try this today. If you search for Graal OTN, or there's the fuel, full URL, you can download a, a binary tarball that includes absolutely everything you need. So it includes our modified JVM, includes the Graal compiler, includes JRuby. And you can try it out like that. If you search for GitHub Graal VM, you'll find all our code in one place. Um, this is the implementation of Ruby. That's just a fork of the JRuby repository. But then there's the implementation of our C extensions and the JIT compiler and everything you want in one place. And you can browse the code and see how it works. Want to find out more? Um, if you look at my website, I list all the papers and blog posts and articles we do there. Find us on through you node JRuby or Gitter or tweet me. Um, if you forget everything else, just Google for JRuby Truffle and you'll find the relevant stuff. I should say there's a really large team behind this. We're actually the largest Ruby implementation team anywhere in the world, I think. Um, these people work on all sorts of projects, but uh, it's a few of the wider team, and that's everyone who's ever been involved. The main people working on Ruby are myself, Kevin Menard, Peter Halupa, Benoit Delos, uh, Brandon Fish, and the people working on the C extensions are Manuel Rigger and Matthias Grimmer. So I'm, this is all their work as well as being mine. Thanks very much. Questions? Uh, the question was that you need the, do you need the C source code but not things you link against? Yes, you need the C source code of anything that uses the Ruby C API, but then anything else can be a binary. So you can use your database driver or any other libraries you're using. You just need the parts that use the C API as C source code, or LLVMIR actually, but that's not, um, uh, if you want to do it to obfuscate your code, LLVMIR doesn't do it, so you basically need the source code. Yeah, the questions were, is there any locking going on? Because the C, doesn't, the C code normally doesn't do locking. No, we're not doing any locking. We're following the, the Rubinius and Joby approaches to threading, which is that you need to lock data structures and objects you use yourself, and anything else is uncontrolled. We are doing novel research into a formal memory model for Ruby, which um, Peter Looper's working on, has talked about at a couple of conferences. So we're trying to work out what the rules should be, agree them across Ruby implementations. Um, but at the moment, it's wild west world. There's no real rules to follow. So as long as stuff works, we're happy. Yeah, the question is, when you use native code, of course, you have to actually do that copying to pass it in and out. And real libraries mostly, real C extensions mostly use native libraries. So do we have to do that a lot? Yes, and we're not sure how big a problem that is. So the, as you said, the PSD and um, chunky stuff, that's well contained, and that's the best case for us. Um, we're working on OpenSSL open at the moment, and it seems to be effective enough there. So all I can say at the moment is I'm hopeful for other gems. We won't have to do too much copying um, to pass it out to native code. You can, of course, if you want to, if you find it's a problem, get the source code for everything and run it all in the C interpreter. The C interpreter is a full conformant implementation of C, so it should be able to run everything. With OpenSSL, I decided for things like timing attacks and installation complexity, it was probably best to use the native library. But yes, it, we are unsure if it's gonna work perfectly for lots of libraries. It's a research project, and that's why we're, we're exploring what, what we can do. Yeah, so the, the question was, were the results I showed on warmed up code? Yes, they're on thoroughly warmed up code. Um, we use the JIT compiler, so it does need time to warm up and to compile everything. Um, Joe Truffle is about as fast as Ruby 1.8 when it starts. Um, probably a bit slower now. Um, and then it gets much faster after we been running. It, it's a trade-off. We're deliberately making this trade-off that if we spend more time at startup getting things optimized, then stuff runs faster later. Um, but we have a solution for the, the fast startup case where you need that. We're working on ahead of time compiled binary of Joe Ruby Truffle that a, it doesn't use a JVM. It's simply a big executable. And that starts really fast because all the code is already compiled. Um, and then it warms up the same way the normal one does. But that's not open source at the moment. Um, but we have to do some sort of trade-off. In order to cut through Ruby and to get the performance we want, something has to give somewhere. So we trade off a little bit of memory, a little bit of startup time, and we get the result we want running after a longer period of time. Uh, how much memory? It's hard to quantify because until we can run a real application, we, we don't know. So we can look at the baseline and say it takes four times as much memory as JRuby to run Hello World or something like that. I've got the numbers, I can't remember what they are exactly off the top of my head. Um, but I'd be lying if I told you I knew exactly what the, the memory consumption would be. It's probably unlikely to work well on a 500 megabyte dyno, that's true. Um, but the idea is if you run 
yeah, the, the idea is if you run one big instance which can handle lots of clients and can share optimized code between them, we think that would be a better trade-off than running lots of MRIs on smaller dynos. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah.